Hey friends, uh, my name is Jonathan Page. I'm the Director of Connectional Ministries for Innovation and Creativity in the Virginia Annual Conference. And today I'm excited for the next installment of our conference-wide series called Voting While Christian. Uh, in this series, we're sharing resources that can help people of faith consider their faith alongside their civic responsibilities leading up to the general election that's happening this November in the United States. And today I am honored and uh, privileged to be spending some time with our guest. Uh, his name is the Reverend Dr. James Howell. James is uh, the lead pastor at, uh, or excuse me, the senior pastor at uh, Myers Park United Methodist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, he's been there since 2003. James is originally from uh, Columbia, South Carolina. He studied chemistry and physics at the University of South Carolina before he went to Duke Divinity School, uh, where he uh, received his Master of Divinity degree alongside a PhD in Old Testament. He's the author of 17 books. Uh, he is uh, a leader within the United Methodist Church uh, and also within the city of Charlotte. Uh, he's married to Lisa. They have three kids. And uh, James is a, a, a person who's had influence on my life and the lives of many. Uh, he's a respected thought leader in the United Methodist Church and, and is often sought after to offer perspective and commentary on a wide variety of subject matters, particularly of interest to us in this conversation today is he has been engaged in a series at Myers Park called The Election, Your Spirituality, and the Soul of Our Nation. And that's going to be a big part of our focus today. So, uh, James, thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, Jonathan, it's always good to see you and talk to you and be with you today. Well, uh, James, we're we're hitting record on a conversation, and we're officially uh, less than a month to go until uh -huh. November fifth. Um, so, given kind of where things are at this point, and especially being mindful of what you've been doing in your church uh, with the election, your spirituality, and the soul of our nation, I I think a lot about Wesley and and the historic question in class meetings. How is it with your soul? I wonder for you, uh, and you think about the soul of our nation. How is it with our soul today? Yeah, I mean, it, it's at so many levels. People are uh, people are just a mess. Uh, there's so much anxiety. There's so much negativity. It's hard to get away from it. You you watch a ball game and there's the ad, and you, you walk in the park and somebody's talking and somebody's wearing a MAGA hat or a Harris Walls T-shirt or something. And it's just and everybody's so angry and enraged. Some are the victims of it. They. They hate that it's coming at them. Some some are they're doling it out. I know as a pastor, I've been discouraged uh, quite a few times. People that they sit in front of me on Sunday morning, they nod, they hug me on the way out of church, and then I see on Facebook posting just nastiness. And we've been talking about it. I talk about it every Sunday. We've been doing a series. Uh, people just losing their minds, and uh, and then it's the soul of the nation. You know, who not who am I as an individual? What relationships have been fractured? But you know, what what's what's at the heart of who we are as a country? And I, I'm not sure anybody feels real good about that. What does it mean for us to be part of healing the soul of the nation? Any, anyway, I'm rambling, but uh, there's just there's a lot that's at stake right now in terms of our our spiritual life and uh, what church is called to do. Anyway. Yeah. And and so as you sense that sort of that, a word that comes to mind as, as you describe that is fracture, um, mm -hmm. that there's there's a sense of fracture in our soul. What I, I mean, in, in you know, the, the, other than like Jesus returning, is there is there healing for that fracture that can take place? Yeah, yeah. Fra I hadn't thought of this till just now. When when something's fractured, it's got really sharp edges uh, yeah. that can cut you, and uh, people are experiencing that. You know, I, some of it is uh, reminding. I mean, healing's got to come from one understanding like what's really going on. Uh, I say over and over, and people get tired of hearing it, but I'm still sure I'm right. Today's idolatry. I used to think it was money or pleasure something today's idolatry is political ideology people really believe if my party wins the kingdom will dawn if my party loses the world may come to an end it and so that really is our true god 
you know, Christianity Today put a great issue in August on the election. One of the things that said in there is that something we in the church can say is that this is not apocalyptic. We, we think it's apocalyptic, like everything's at stake. No, no, this it's just another election. Russell Moore in that edition said, your party will lose this election. And somebody said, you don't know my party. He said, yeah, but your party. And his point is, we're, we'll all lose because we're just in the situation. So uh, naming what's wrong uh, naming, uh, what, what is God looking for from us? We, we act like we think sort of this kind of rage and I'm going to unfriend somebody. I'm not speaking to him anymore. I think venomous thoughts. This is not of God. Uh, we can see traces of God's spirit over just those simple things like fruit of the spirit, love. Is there love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, uh, what does it mean for us as the people of God to uh, cultivate, I don't know, humility, mm-hmm. curiosity, charity? Um, and, I th- and I think naming, I heard Walter Brueggemann, this is way, it wasn't about the election, but I was driving to church one Sunday morning and he was on Krista Tippett's On Being program. Yeah. I just heard this gravelly voice come on, God, it's Walter Brueggemann. And all I heard him say right after I turned it on was he said, This is so wise. He said, everybody's afraid. He says, some people are afraid that the world that they've cherished and counted on is crumbling around them. And everybody else is afraid that the world they dream of will never come to be. Somehow, to understand that we're riddled by fear, but so is the other person, the mean person, the angry person. Um, that that's that's the beginning of healing. You might call that repentance, right? It's not yeah. like, oh, I was horrible, but it's it's discovering, diagnosing what the problem is and trying to move toward healing. Yeah, that's that's so wise. And I, I think also uh, so courageous in this kind of atmosphere and climate to, to be, um, that's that that strikes me as being almost culturally resistant. Uh, I have to imagine, especially in a place like Charlotte, you know, you're in, in what has, has largely become a battleground state, uh, in, in, hmm. um, the, the national sphere. Do you, do you sense, um, you know, it's interesting. I actually had a note, you're, uh, one of your earliest posts in the series, you, you talk pretty openly about sort of that Pauline idea of a more excellent way. Um, and that, that in this season that is often, characterized by humility, curiosity, charity, and, and a hopeful spirit. I wonder, um, are there glimpses of that that you see in the midst of, of sort of the fracture, the fear, and the battle uh, that's ongoing? Oh, it's so hard. Uh, you know, I've heard people anecdotally say that they, they've been attentive to what we're trying to offer as a church, but but also just they're in a Bible study or they're somewhere, and and they hear they hear what do they hear? They hear things like God calls us to uh, sacrifice. You know, one of my additions was when uh, John Kennedy was inaugurated. He did the "Ask Not What Your Country Can Do for You." Well, can you, nobody, no candidate says that today. But at the heart of the Christian life is I, I don't grab for me. I work for others. And, and this one woman told me she started pondering that. And then every ad she saw, uh, she perceived it through that lens. And every ad is, if you vote for me, you'll have more money. If you vote for me, you'll be more comfortable. Mm-hmm. And she's saying, we're supposed to be thinking about others, right? <laughs> uh, so that's super interesting. And then I had a clergy gathering the other day and, um, I brought up the thing that was also named in that Christianity today issue of, uh, I think this is interesting and true, is that increasingly people, it's not even issue-related anymore. It's tribal. So it's like, I'm with the conservative guys, and whoever the leader of that is, whenever, could say, we're about this now. And you go, okay, yay, that's us. And we, we're we defined by we hate those other guys, and they're evil and, and stupid and dangerous. But then other people in the other tribe, and this pastor said, 
our job as clergy is to say we're a tribe. We're, we're, the, we're the true tribe. That We're the constructive tribe. We're, we're the body of Christ. And why are we here? We're here to be the people of God. And that doesn't mean we're cheerleaders for one side or the other, or we're angrier than the other, or we want to baptize this ideology or the other. We're going to be above that. We, I'll I, I say one more thing on that. We, uh, as we're recording this, we're uh, intensely into um, Helene relief work. Right, right. And um, yeah, it's pretty interesting. We were collecting water, and all these people showed up. And some were our people, but some were like Jewish people came, and there were a couple of Muslims. And one woman, she was working harder than anybody. I said, where do you go to church? She kind of laughs at that. I don't go to church. I don't even believe in God, but I think this is important. Yeah. And so we did all that. And then on the receiving end, so either the giving end or the receiving end, we didn't say, what's your political ideology, right? God's work is above all of that. God's work appeals not to this dark side that's angry and fearful. God's word appeals to what's noblest in us, to the image of God and us, to the compassion that we all really do carry, even though it gets crusted over. So, the, so that's the, those are some you know moments of healing uh, that you see people working together. It's a shame something like a storm has to come up to bring that out, but, right. but there it is. It's kind of like that. Those moments of crisis sometimes bring out the best in us, but but why why does it take the the crisis to to be the best? Right, like that's a that's a hard hard build as well. And I heard, and I heard somebody we we had a work team go up to. Um, Canton in the mountains of North yeah, Carolina sure. for, for a work thing Saturday. And uh, somebody in my group that was there who's a card-carrying liberal was really annoyed that some volunteers who showed up from the area were wearing MAGA hats. And she her reaction was like, this is no time for... She, she was you know barking at that. And I tried to calm her down and say, you know, may, if I know those guys, and I, I know some of them, I think I think they might want to say we're we're not the bad guys you think we are. We we mm. care about people that are in need. It's just a whole different way of looking at, you know, what what does a hat mean? What does a t-shirt mean? Every, everybody feels judged, everybody is judging. That, that's just not our way. Yeah. Well, and it's I think one of the one of the challenges is when it when it comes to how we practice our faith in in a space of election, the uh, the gospel of Jesus doesn't fit neatly into a two-party system, right? There's there are elements that that likely would have more conservative alignment, elements that would likely have a more liberal alignment. I I wonder, uh, you know, it, do you find? I, I, I imagine there are a number of folks in Virginia who are listening to this who who may have folks in their communities who say, well, if you're a Christian, you need to vote for this person. Uh, and it, it, depending on the congregation, depending on the person, it might be a different candidate on either end. Um, what's is, is there a more nuanced way to talk about our faith as it relates to who we support in a particular election? Well, I mean, I mean, some of it, I think, is uh, more. How do we? between now and the election, then the day you vote, and then the day after the election, like that's coming, how do, how do we live as people of faith? And that that's having some equilibrium. That's that fruit of the Spirit. That's how do we... We're supposed to be, our strong suit is supposed to be reconciliation, right? So how do we... How do we uh, become arbiters of that? How do we help reconciliation happen? With voting, I mean, some of it, you, you know, you know that... Uh, all, all votes, given our system, are going to be a bit compromised. There's going to be something toxic in everybody. So you try to think, I think, you try to think through, how can I cast my vote in a way that leans in a holy Christian direction? And, and you, you know, you, I, I don't know why I didn't realize this until about a month ago, uh, sort of a strict rule in United Methodism and uh, mainline Protestantism in general is we don't endorse candidates, right? That's just like you just, you're forbidden to do that. That's interesting because Roman Catholics endorse candidates. The black churches endorse candidates. The white evangelicals endorse candidates. Everybody does except us. And it's probably just as well uh, that we don't. Um, and then another thing I'd, I'd 
tr- try to urge people to think about oh, a lot of folks I know are one issue voters yeah. and, and people's minds go to abortion, but it's not just abortion. It might be uh, women's rights. It might be, I mean, whatever it is, we're kind of one issue, but we, we always need to think uh, wisely about that because you can vote on the one issue, but then you get something. It's not like your one vote's going to win the day, but uh, a bunch of you vote for one person on one thing, but then the person gets an office and a lot of the other baggage that they carry with them is actually contrary to what we're about. So it's never just you know, one issue, uh, my wife, she loves to say to people who they're concerned about life in the womb, and we revere and love life, life in the womb. She says, well, what about life after birth, right? right? right. <laughs> if you care about life in the womb, you've got to really care about life after birth. Anyhow, yeah. Absolutely. No, and it's and it's a lot of times I think what we end up seeing is um, – is, is there's uh, almost a failure in understanding about just basic lessons of civics that, you know, a, a, just because a president has a particular policy position doesn't mean that they have uh, short of an executive order or action. Uh, you know, there's there's often uh, you have to have a few other people aligned with you in that and in, in Congress and things like that. And that's um, it, it's interesting. I, I was watching the vice presidential debate the other night, and one of the questions I thought would be kind of interesting for them to ask is can you can you name something significant the vice president has has done <laughs> the last, you know <laughs> and, and ever right? yeah, uh, yeah. Don, just... Don, donald trump is demeaning harris as a vice president like she had all this power and somebody right. said he didn't have any power over mike pence mm-hmm. and on the debates i thought this this occurred to me recently sure. is i'd love to see the debate where one candidate says something and the other one says wow, that's, that's a good idea. I, I never thought of it that way. I, I think I'm changing my thinking now. <laughs> I, I'd vote for that person, right? If sure, they would do sure. that, but no, nobody will do that. Even well, changing your mind, right? That's just the kiss of death in politics, but we should work. We're, we're all about the metanoia repentance means you change your mind. We're all about changing our mind and knowing what we don't know and learning what we didn't know or what we were wrong about. And that's it's it's often, you know, I, I remember in the in the presidential debate, there were both candidates were asked about, well, you you once said this and now you say this. What happened? And as if it's, you know, shifting your perspective is a bad thing. Uh, you know, I, I, I agree with you. I'd love to hear somebody say, well, I became more educated on a conversation or a subject matter. I had a story that, that helped to shape and inform me. And and I think something that can happen if we're not careful within our churches is we become um so so concrete in in saying well this is how it is that we miss that chance for the fluidity and the and the sort of um the grace that can come from being able to say i have a different perspective now um i i I was struck in one of your writings you referenced um arthur brooks uh, talking Mm -hmm. about the the idea of being missionaries for love in the face of contempt i thought that 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 concept is really powerful what does it look like when when people feel as if they have to be those missionaries within the walls of their own churches? Boy, yeah. Because you'd like to think uh, that we in the church can be one in that missionary activity, but, but you can never assume that. You know, mm-hmm. we... I was in a conversation the other day with you know, four or five people kind of standing around the hallway of the church, and pretty pretty soon four of them were voicing one perspective, and probably the sweetest woman there, I love it, she just very gently spoke up and said, I, I, I'm not really where you guys are, and everybody just got silent. Like, <laughs> like In the church, we ought to be able to talk to each other, but then also if we get clear on who we are and why we're here, we ought to we ought to be able to be unified on this. You know, what is our mission, right? To be missionaries for love in the face of contempt. Like all Christians, whichever way you might lean politically, ought to be able to get together on board. Ought to be on board together with that. But but we don't talk a lot about that. We maybe we wall up. Well, we're a liberal church. Okay. Well, we're a conservative church. Okay. Or my, the Sunday school, we have that. We have Sunday school classes. We're a conservative Sunday school class. We're the liberal son. No, it's just so sad. 
Uh, so how do we learn, again, reconciliation? That ought to be our great gift to the world, to the country, to the soul of the nation. You know, we have to know how to do, I've got this thing in front of me, Lincoln's second inaugural. I mean, if you want to think about a divided country. And the man said, I mean, it's a great words. It ought to be our mission statement, right? With malice toward none, with charity for all, let's strive uh, to finish the work we're in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to do all which we, we may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. I mean, just beautiful words. And that's part of what, it, what I think the soul of our nation ought to be about. But we've just so lost sight of that. Yeah, yeah. Is there, I, I'm curious, James, as you think about sort of what it takes to get there, um, one of the things that that I think we see coming back to the Helene piece, right? Right now, over the weekend, there is a, a pretty big issue with like misinformation around um, what like fund appropriation and things like that. Are there ever times where it's appropriate for Christians to kind of call out and say like, hey, you know, it's not that, that there's one candidate that's sort of like better than the other in terms of the eyes in the eyes of Christ or something like that. But like, is there ever a time for people of faith to call out and say, Hey, that's from a faith-based perspective. That's not okay. <sighs> yeah. I had a, one of my uh, fellow pastors at Myers park, this was years ago in another election. I could see this guy was just, I know he's a conservative and he was just chewing on my pastor colleague. And I kind of watched to see what would happen. And my pastor colleague, after the guy let up for a moment, responded just by saying, you're watching too much Fox News. I, I think it's important to name that kind of misinformation is all over the place. And it's not even that people are liars anymore. It, it, since it's all about ideology, then any fact, it doesn't even have to be factual, but any fact, anything you say becomes good because it feeds the ideology. And I, mm -hmm. I think to name that, and I think to name the danger of that for what we do, you know, we are, we trade in words in Christianity. We trade in a message and we trade in people trusting that it's true, but then we live in a world where like, nobody really trusts that anything is true anymore, right? People say to me, a lot of people, they just buy into whatever their ideology says. You know, one guy was telling me, Barack Obama's the most corrupt president ever. He had more charges of corruption than any president. Ever. Well, it's just not a true st statement, right? He heard that somewhere. Uh, anyway, uh, so, but how do we then get people to trust our message and then how do they distinguish our message from the rest of what they're hearing they tend to hear it and think does that back up you know what what i believe politically or not and then the sermon the class whatever is valued or not based on that alignment just a dangerous time yeah and you just got to name that i yeah that's right that's right well and it's and it's a particular point of tension i think if, if we can just name it for pastors um, mm -hmm. You know, you talked a few moments ago about not endorsing particular political candidates and and that sort of thing. Um, but you know how how you and I got to know each other first in in this life uh, was you're my professor at Duke Divinity School uh, in a course on Christian leadership. Um, you've you've mm -hmm. been a leader of the church for uh, decades now. I, I wonder, kind of given your place as a clergy leader who's charged with balancing many different political persuasions and perspectives in a in an area that's particularly polarized I, I guess what what wisdom do you have for clergy leaders as they address or as they don't address political matters leading up to the election oh yeah that's a great question i'd love to hear you answer it but the <laughs> um you know i think so recently, I pulled together a group of clergy from our district. We have a big, sprawling district of 150-something clergy, and a good, a good group came. They wanted to come, and they want to meet again. It, we just talked about being a pastor during the election season. And, um, you know, one thing is so many pastors in general, but certainly of this kind of thing, feel isolated. Uh, they feel like they're under attack. They feel like they've got to— um, 
withhold some of what they believe passionately, not because it's political, they, they know it's the gospel thing, but they know if I say this, I'm just going to get blistered by my people, or they're going to walk out, they, or they could give me the silent treatment. So pastors really, in that gathering, it was amazing. People just needed to, pastors needed to be together to kind of share what they're dealing with and how they're trying to deal with it and how it's painful. I don't know when that got to be a thing, right? That that it, it's okay to be brutal to your pastor. Like, when did that get to be a thing on any side, on any issue? People used to have a not a reverence for pastors, but there was a respect. You know, here here's somebody who they, they I could have been a doctor. I could have been I could have been a lot of things. I went into the ministry and some sort of honoring of that as part of your own faith life. Anyway, um, who decided it was okay to write a long, vicious note to your pastor and accuse him of being, I've had people accuse me of being stupid. Well, I'm not stupid. I might, I'm wrong on a great many things, but anyhow. I uh, get a PhD if you're a doctor. Uh, but but and we're, we're the peculiar profession. In yeah, the, sure, sure, sure. You know, people don't go to a physicist and the physicist says, here's the second law of thermodynamics. You don't say, I think that, that law is wrong. I mean, mm-hmm. it's just mm-hmm. not a thing. But people are more than happy to tell me how my theology is wrong. And so as pastors, yeah, you, you know, this is not just with the election. You got to learn how to welcome that thing and how to be patient with that thing and keep your arms around people. It's hard when they're being mean, but I can always say to people, you know, thank you for sharing with me. And I, I, you may not feel it, but I really do love you. I want to keep this conversation going. You got to draw some boundaries. I mean, some of those people are just, so those people are mean to my colleagues, and I've had to say to a few of them, you, you got to stop abusing my colleague. Just as your pastor, I want to say you got to stop abusing my colleague. And I've had to say that, like, I'm happy to listen to you, but you're being abusive, and I, I, I won't take that. I'll take a conversation. I'll love you, but it, it's just not a Christian thing for me even to let you be abusive to me. That's hard. It's hard. It's so hard because uh, uh, I do think for for clergy, uh, there's there's this sense of um, just apart from the political sphere, there's a it, it can feel as if there's a decline of resources, a decline of opportunity, a decline oh. of attendance, that sort of thing. And so so you don't want to do something that's going to wrinkle feathers in a way that you know creates creates more dissension or more issues, but that leading from a place of fear is almost always bad news, right? And so, you know, sort of figuring out how do you, we we have a mantra here in our connectional ministries that we have some standards that we try to practice. And, and one of our standards is no one is a doormat. Um, and that's not a, it's not a, you don't have to be aggressive and like, <laughs> and, and be uh, angry at people or anything like that. But if, if, if somebody like you're describing, if somebody's being abusive or somebody's, um, challenging you in a way that's unfair or untoward, you know, being able to say, hey, uh, com- coming back to those ideas of, you know, humility and curiosity and charity and hopefulness, can can we reframe this, right? Is there an opportunity? And, and, and like you say, I think so much of that happens when you're in relationship and in conversation, not in competition. There, were, there was an ideal when I came out of seminary, maybe when you did uh, as well, that uh, my my great, well, I never really intended to stay in the ministry. That's a different story. But uh, mm-hmm. but when I, as long as I was doing it, my ideal was I will be a fiery prophetic voice, mm-hmm. right? And I prided myself on a, I'm a fiery prophetic voice. People throw cold water on that like in a nanosecond, and it's easy to feel noble, like, oh, I was right, and they're just such fools. They can't hear God's prophetic word. They didn't hear Jeremiah. They didn't hear Isaiah. They crucified Jesus. He started doing this thing. Mm -hmm. And and it's quickly forgotten. I forgot it so many times that, you know, being right and delivering the truth to someone, it's way overrated. Right. It, it's valuable if I can find the way to do that, that um, one respects and honors the other person where they are. That really is love. 
and they can understand it comes from a place of love. The other is is realizing where what can people hear now. Um, I, th- I think I think I've been at this church twenty one plus years, so I think there's some things I can say now that I couldn't have said at all twenty one years ago, or ten years ago, or even five years ago. Right? You're always kind of moving the needle a little. You're plowing the ground. You're fertilizing, getting people readier to hear what just isn't native to them. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of patience. You know, it's hard, and you can feel like a weenie in the meantime, like, well, I should have come out and said this, but th- they couldn't hear it. They couldn't receive it, so like, why do it? You know, you just, you just, you're just whacking them, and then they leave the church, and then they never hear you again. So, so then, that's not any good. And then, and then lay people, I mean, bless their hearts. Uh, they're, they're lovely creatures, and I'm so grateful for them. I, I did a workshop years ago that was great fun. It, it wasn't, it, I'd, I'd done a lot of the things on how to preach. So I decided to do one okay. on how to hear a sermon. All right. Okay. Okay. We haven't, we haven't really thought through as laity, like, why are you coming to church? How, how do you hear a sermon? How do you come with expectation? How do you, and the big driver, driver on that, I think, I've told this in a number of settings. It, it is interesting. When I started in the ministry, it's 40 plus years ago. If I preached and somebody leaving church wanted to pay me the highest possible compliment, they would say, Oh, Pastor, you stepped on my toes today. <laughs> right? Now, no one says that. Today, if somebody wants to pay me a compliment, they come out and they say, Pastor, I agree with you. Mm. Well, that's we've come light years, right? From I come to church to hear what I didn't understand, what I was confused about, something that's true that I'd miss, something that is even corrective in my soul. So now I've got the answers, and does that guy agree with me or not? And if he doesn't, uh, I don't know about him. He's <clears throat> he's a fool. I'm not going to go to his church. We have people walk out of the church, you know, and, and as a pastor, I mean, I'd say to pastors out there, it's so it's easy for me to say, Hey, if somebody leaves, you know, don't take it personally. It's not personal, man. It always feels personal. I can have 15 people say you're the best pastor we've ever had. I loved your sermon, but one person reams me out and leaves. That's who I'm thinking about when I'm lying in the bed that night. And it just eats my insides. So hard. People need to remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a, it's a good charge to, to laity as well, right? Like just yeah. to say, hey, just like what your pastor says from the pulpit matters, what you say to one another matters, including what you did, what you say to your pastor or the staff in your church. I wonder, are there other uh, any other wisdom for for lay leaders in in the church, kind of in in the space of an election season and kind of where we're at? Well, I mean, I've, I've just been an electionary, <clears throat> excuse me, I've been preaching on the letter of James, which I always parse as being Jesus' brother. And it goes on at length about the tongue, the danger of the tongue and taming the tongue. And the tongue is not just for truth, but for gentleness and compassion and love. And for people, for us, for laity clergy, just to think about that, to dwell on that, to ask hard questions, looking in the mirror. What, what am I? And it's not even the stuff that you say out loud. I, I think the, the most toxic talking that goes on goes on inside our head. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm sitting here and I look out the window and I see somebody come by with a, they got a flag on their car. I mean, whatever. And I just see what, ugh. it's eating me alive. But it's not of God, and and uh, Jesus really comes to set us free from that, to liberate us from that, and we we don't avail ourselves of that liberty so often, right? We kind of want God to back us up in our rage, but but mm-hmm. God God wants to, yeah, you know, like you don't have to. That's why Jesus said, the, "Thou shalt not kill." I say that if you if you harbor anger in your heart, and He's not doing that to beat you up, like yeah, I caught you being angry. It's like you don't have to be, you don't have to do that. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah. It's just, there's a there's a better way, right? Like there's always a, way, a higher a, way, or a more excellent way. So, so James, kind of in our, our closing moments here, I, I'm I'm thinking not only about the next month, but I'm thinking about the days that come after that. Hmm. Um, in in sort of life on the other side of November fifth, um, I wonder from your perspective, is there any kind of common thread 
in what a Christian response to the results of the election are, no matter which candidate ends up actually winning. Um, and then I guess the the sort of sub question to that is, are there distinctions if we end up with a president elect named Harris versus one named Trump or something like that? But just what does what does that Christian response look like in the wake of what happens? You know, I, I think to uh, prepare, I don't know. I think I think to prepare now. Uh, what, what what will my response be? Right. And so it's to remember, like, this is not apocalyptic, it may feel apocalyptic, but not. If my side wins, that's not triumph. That's not vengeance on my foes. They don't go away. They're still there. They're still Americans. They need to be represented, cared for, loved. You're, you're half the people. I always tell people, uh, anybody who's vested in politics, like half the people you pass in traffic and you're trusting them with your life, right, in traffic. Half of them disagree with you politically and you think they're utter fools. That's going to be true after the election. Half of them are going to be very happy, and the other half are going to be just miserable. It's a time for tenderness. It's a time for a kindness. I, would, I, would, I always think you know, to heal the soul of the nation, people, we, we feel like we're such victims. Like, I hate the way politics is. Well, we're the voters. We, we support that. We vote. Based on negative ads, we all that stuff, right? So just decide and spread it around. We're, we're going to be different. We're not going to respond to negative ads. We're going to look for candidates who could say I was wrong. We're going to be people who, some of us, what's government for and what isn't government for? People complaining about what the government is doing or isn't doing up in the mountains where the Helene came. What is government for? What, what is church for? Uh, and the go church can't do things like rebuild a washed out road. Like yeah. we can't do that, but the government can and should and will. Right. And so our problem isn't that there are 535 people that are elected and the 51% of them are fools that are ruining the country or they're saints that are saving the country. The, the problem isn't those guys. It, it's in all of us. And if we want different candidates, if we want different elections, if we want a different tone of the world, it, it's up. The, ch the church, we're small, but we really could make a difference. Christianity, I gave a lecture at the beginning of the series, and I thought this was my best point, is that Christianity was born during a season when most people in the world loathed their government. Mm. I mean, they hated it, and they thought it was evil, and it would just be the ruin of things. Christianity was born in such a time. Christianity grew in such a time, and Christianity, in some measure, like made that stuff kind of better, maybe, you could mm -hmm. say. But Christianity survived and thrived during such a thing, and it wasn't by holding up and saying, oh, the world's terrible. They went out into the world with a message of love and with a message of, of hope, and people needed it, and it caught on. So I really think we that might happen again. Like I, I think we could do that if, if that's what we set our mind to, to be those kinds of missionaries out in the world. It's beautiful. No, I think that's absolutely beautiful. And the only rejoinder I would I would offer is, you know, when we talk about that idea of the soul of the nation and that that place of fracture is I, I was thinking about this at a, an argument over the weekend with a really close friend of mine about fantasy football, which is, you know, the most virtuous of mm -hmm. arguments and uh and and we really were going at each other and finally i just i i put my phone down <laughs> we're, we're text a text argument by the way which is even better yeah, yeah, yeah. my phone down for an hour and uh and then i text him i was like hey this is dumb and we're <laughs> friends and and i'm sorry and and i wonder if maybe a part of the response is uh, we we live in a culture that looks for a rapid response and sometimes we need a rapid response right like when we when we have a if there is a disaster, it is good to be quick on our feet and responding. If there's a, a tragedy that befalls a family, it's good to be quick to respond. But there's so many moments in life where it's not really being the first to respond. It's being able to have the right response um, and, and maybe just not saying anything for a day or two is not the end of the world um, and just being patient with the folks around you. Yeah, and that stillness is it. It, evo it evokes humility, and right. it's also a space in which you you can actually listen. It kind of kind of matters. <laughs> and it does. It kind of does. Well, 
Well, it's been a joy to listen to you today, James, uh, and, and you've blessed our annual conference with your wisdom and your thoughts. Uh, you are the guest. I always love for the guest to be able to have the last word. Is there anything else that you'd want somebody who's been participating in this conversation to take away as they head into the next days and, and the next uh, moments ahead as a, a person who's voting while Christian? I, uh, in my, I don't know, in my sermon yesterday, I asked the, I didn't know the answer to this. After all, after Helene came through and all, there was all this damage, I said, was there a rainbow? Hmm. I, I don't remember anybody saying, I saw a rainbow. Over. And the rain, we forget rainbows aren't like something pretty to take a photo of to put on Facebook, right? Rainbow, that was God's promise after the worst catastrophe when everything seemed hopeless that, that God's here, there is hope. That this is not the end. God is with us, right? And so, I, there's hope. God, God, it's God's God, right? So it's not apocalyptic. It's you know, look for a rainbow. Yeah, look for the rainbows. I love that. Well, well, James, we're grateful for you and for your leadership in the United Methodist Church and at Myers Park in Charlotte, and um, I'm grateful for your time with us today. What uh, I would say to those who have tuned in, thank you for taking the time to be invested in this conversation and uh, and continue to check out uh, vaumc.org slash voting while Christian. Uh, we will continue to be building resources leading up to November 5th uh, for you, for your congregation, for your community. Uh, and, and we're grateful for the opportunity to serve and share together uh, as United Methodists in this season. James, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you everyone for listening.